I'm Sharon Rounds, Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the Warren Alpert Medical School. And it's my pleasure on behalf of uh, Jack Elias, uh, Dean of Biology of Medicine, and Ashish Shah, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, uh, to welcome you all today to the Paul Levenger Decoding Disparities uh, Seminar Series. This uh, series is a joint effort between the medical school and the School of Public Health to uh, uh, focus on inequalities and health disparities that are experienced in healthcare today. Our goals for the series are to help us all gain a better understanding of where we need to make progress and what still needs to be learned as we work to close the gap on racial, economic, and social disparities in healthcare in America. I want to acknowledge uh, the work of those who made this uh, series a reality, in, uh, including the planning committee from the medical school and the School of Public Health and a great uh, team who have uh, worked hard to make this uh, series a reality. We're also fortunate to have this lecture series sponsored by the Paul Levenger Professorship in Economics of Healthcare. Uh, this professorship was established uh, in 1987 to honor the memory of Paul Levenger. Uh, the gift was made by his wife, the late Ruth Levenger, and their daughter, Betty Levenger Cohen, and her husband, uh, John Cohen, who was a pediatrician uh, member of the Brown class of 1959. Um, at this point, I would like to invite uh, Dr. David Williams, who is a uh, director of the Brown uh, Center for Health Promotion and Health, and Health Equity, uh, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Monica Baskin. Dr. Baskin is a professor of preventive medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine and associate director for community outreach and engagement at the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center, which is at UAB. Dr. Baskin received her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Sociology from Emory and a Master of Science in Community Multicultural Counseling and her PhD in Counseling Psychology from Georgia State University. She completed a postdoc fellowship in pediatric psychology at Emory and is a licensed psychologist. Dr. Baskin's research focuses on minority health and health disparities using community-based participatory methods to better understand and address individual, family, and environmental factors associated with healthy eating, physical activity, obesity, and cancer prevention. Her work has been funded by the NIH, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and by other regional and local foundations. Dr. Baskin is a trained and authorized facilitator of nationally recognized training programs on unconscious bias for health professionals and equity, diversity, and inclusion. She's the UAB School of Medicine Senior Representative on the Council of Faculty and Academic Societies of the Association of American Medical Colleges. And importantly, she's president of the Society of Behavioral Medicine. Um, this is an international organization and it has been my home, my academic home for over 20 years. And so it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Baskin. She will be speaking today about disparities and health outcomes. Who pays the cost? Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, at least virtually, if not in person. And so I'm gonna spend um, a good deal of time talking to you about an interesting topic um, about you know, who's really paying the cost for the disparities and health outcomes. So over the course of the next um, you know, 45 minutes or so, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the differential burden of chronic diseases in the US. And, and as was mentioned in my introduction, a lot of my work is around cancer prevention. So I'll use some examples from our work in, um, here in, in Alabama as it relates to cancer, cancer prevention and control. And then I'll pivot and talk a little bit about costs of health inequity. So some of them are sort of your typical costs that you might think of, and then others that we, um, particularly our indirect costs that we might not consider as much um, when we think about these issues of disparities and health outcomes. And lastly, I wanna leave you with a couple of ideas about how we might close the gaps um, in terms of addressing the disparities that, we, that exist here today. So, 
this is a slide um, of some maps, many of which I'm sure you've already seen. So these are our chronic disease and health disparities burdens um, across the, the country with, the, excuse me, with respect to the first one being around um, cancer. Um, the second, the figure two is around cardiovascular disease. And the third one is around um, diabetes. So across each of those, what you might see is that there's a certain swath of the United States where you'll see higher rates of um, mortality as it relates to cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And if you haven't figured out yet, you know, part of that has to do with the region that I currently live in. And so each of those chronic diseases in particular have some things in common. Um, so we know that the behavioral risk factors related to smoking, diet, and physical activity um, primarily impact the mor mortality as well as um, the uh, um, associated disability, sorry, disability adjusted life years. So particularly in the two states that I've been doing most of my work, we'll notice that the rates of smoking, the rates of obesity, um, daily fruit intake and vegetable intake um, are all really higher than what you would expect in the norm. And if you look at, again, you know, what's causing or what's part of the issues there, you'll notice that those patterns are quite similar. And so with respect to cancer, the National Cancer Institute defines a cancer health disparity as any adverse differences in cancer incidence, prevalence, and death. Um, it also it looks at differences in cancer survivorship and burden of cancer or related health conditions that exist among specific groups of people. So we largely think about those disparities when it comes to race and ethnicity or perhaps gender, um, but, but the NCI definition incorporates all kinds of ways in which we may be similar or different. So for example, this is data looking at the cancer death rates by race and ethnicity for the most recent data that's available from 2013 to 2017. And what you'll notice here on this graph is that there are clear differences between um, cancer deaths between males and females, and then with respect to different racial ethnic groups, with primarily non-Hispanic Blacks um, being at the highest rates of, of cancer across the board. And then similar to the other maps, this is a map that looks at the death rates from cancer um, across all sites and using both men and women um, and all races. And what you also notice here is that the darker, the red color or the, um, the, the highest level of incidence is greater than 922.6 per 100,000 uh, individuals um, with a death rate. And you'll notice again, the region, the deep south region that, that I'm in and where we do our work is usually at the very center of that. Um, what you may not be as familiar with is this is the census map for individuals who identify as Black or African American for the 2010 census. And, and if you recall some of the other maps, um, the, the darker shades here, you'll see that there's greater than about 50% or more individuals in those counties um, within those states that identify as Black or African American. So if they were side by side, what you'll probably start to see is that there's a pattern of individuals who are Black or from Af or African descent um, being among those same counties where we see higher rates of many of those chronic conditions that we see in the U.S. Which leads um, a lot of the work that we do in thinking about the intersection of race place and cancer mortality. So this paper from um, a few years ago, look at the age adjusted cancer mortality rates, um, looking at individuals by race. So here primarily focused on black and white. Um, and then also looking at regions of the country. So the Delta region, which is a large part of that deep south region that you saw in uh, a variety of those maps. Um, then looking at the United States and then looking at a comparison between rural areas in non-Delta um, counties in the regional authority or not. So the takeaway message from this particular figure is that across the board with a couple of exceptions, um, what you'll notice is that the rates of cancer um, are higher regardless of where the region is across the country for blacks than for whites. And then the other takeaway from this figure is that regardless of the race or ethnicity, individuals who live within the 252 counties that make up the Delta are also at higher risk for cancer mortality than any other region within the country. 
So again, that set the stage for a lot of the work that we do in outreach and engagement and cancer prevention and control here at UAB. But beyond that, we, we know that there are some biological issues, but part of what has been the prevailing thought um, around public health and preventive medicine is looking beyond the individual biology to look at what the other fa major factors might be that predict um, health outcomes, particularly length of life and quality of life. So you'll see in the figure that there are a number of different things that have been identified by um, this particular map from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that includes physical environment, um, socioeconomic factors, clinical care, and health behaviors. So at the very at the very um, um, top of this uh, top of this model, you'll see that. Health care or clinical care, what we think of access to care and quality of care, despite the fact that that's a lot of our dialogue here about health equity, only um, contributes about 20% um, towards our health outcomes. It's the other conditions, the health behaviors, the socioeconomic factors, and physical environment um, that play the major role in determining the length of life and quality of life. So for those of us who do preventive medicine and public health, the good news is that a lot of those things that you see there over to the right are modifiable factors and therefore there are things that we um, can be hopeful that we can make adjustments to. So what are the, in the social determinants of health, these other factors? Um, so the World Health Organization really identified social determinants of health as those circumstances in which people are born, they grow up, they live, they work in age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness. Um, these circumstances are in turn shaped by a wider set of forces, including our economics, our social policies, and our politics. So social determinants are all those things that really play a role in, in, you know, in, in our health outcomes and, and how we are likely to um, live a healthy life or not so. So as we were thinking about how we would intervene on cancer, we looked at the idea of these modifiable factors like health behaviors and how they impacted um, in cancer prevention and control. And what we saw was that these, a couple of things here. So one, a healthy diet can help sustain a healthy weight and lower risk of cancer, sort of independent of anything else. We also saw that regular physical activity protects against excess body fat and cancer independently. And that overweight and obesity tended to contribute as much as 20% of all cancer related deaths. So similar to the earlier slides, when you think about what are some things that we might be able to do, not only in cancer, but in other major chronic conditions, if we can address issues of diet, physical activity, and, and healthy weight, um, then we should certainly be able to improve health outcomes. So related to the, the issue of place, um, many of you probably have heard this, this, um, this comment about your zip code may be as important as your genetic code in predicting your health outcomes and life expectancy. And that certainly seems to have um, you know, played a role in a lot of the, the evidence that we've seen so far. And so why is it that it's your zip code? Um, your zip code really determines all the things that are in your neighborhood. So school quality, your housing, your employment opportunities, things that you are exposed to in the environment, um, food access, physical activity resources, all of those things are basically, um, you know, really tied to where you live and the resources that are available. So they are also powerful predictors of who's healthy, who's sick, and who lives longer. So one of the things that we decided to do um, in terms of our prevention work was really hone in on not only the, what we typically see in public health types of interventions, where we target the individual when we talk about education and awareness, we wanted to recognize the fact that the environment played a major role as well. And so this was um, taken from some of the work that Dr. Shariki Kumanyika, um, who those of you who do obesity and nutrition work are probably very familiar with, um, but this model they came out with, her colleagues came out in 2007. And they really focused on expanding the obesity research paradigm, specifically in reaching one of the quote unquote hard to reach um, communities, meaning African-American communities. And what's really central to this model and, and what um, my team and I picked up on was the fact that there are these 
context that we have to consider when we're thinking about intervening in populations um, such as our African American populations. So their cultural and psycho, um, psychosocial processes, their historical and social context, and there are the physical and economic environments that are really important to keep in mind when designing interventions. And then the other piece, um, definitely for someone like myself as an African American researcher, you know, one of the things that this model points out is that we have a certain lens depending on our own experiences and the biases that we bring to, to the table. So with that in mind, our focus on community outreach and engagement and how we focus on prevention within our cancer center is really built upon this, um, this general um, schematic here. So we focus our work on credibility and trust. And so our focus on community-based participatory research is one of the main ways that we can do that by engaging individuals from the targeted communities um, to not only be be participants in our, in our research um, and to show up in our clinical trials, um, but these are individuals that are helping us to formulate the research questions, collecting the data, and most importantly, interpreting that data and disseminating it more widely. Um, we also focus a lot on what is that community context. Um, for our cancer center, our, our catchment area, if you will, is the entire state. Um, and Ale for those of you who are not familiar with Alabama, uh, almost 5 million individuals um, call Alabama home, um, but we are also home to a state with um, the vast majority being considered to be rural um, and about 60% of the individuals live in what would be considered a medically underserved area. So those contexts in which people live are really critical to our understanding of what we need to do and how we interact with individuals. Um, the other part that, that is the core of what we do is bi-directional communication. The fact that we are not always just simply going out to the community and telling them what to do, but we're hearing from community members as well, you know, what their interests are, what they want us to focus on, um, so that we are true partners in this work. That then leads to lots of scientific discovery um, because we're getting questions that originate in the community and we have likely very novel questions that we might not have thought of. And then lastly, we want to make sure that whatever we learn, we translate and disseminate that back out. So what we've done has been, you know, really highlighting a proven infrastructure for the re reduction of cancer disparities in particular. For over 17 years, we have funding from the National Cancer Institute um, under the umbrella of the Deep South Network for Cancer Control. So this program really highlighted the local um, individuals. We have um, part-time paid staff in each of the communities and counties that we work in, as well as volunteers that were the direct messengers of all of our cancer prevention work, including some of our interventions around nutrition and physical activity. What we found over the years through this funding is that we can use uh, community feedback to improve our community interventions. Um, we have a program that has not only um, been shown to be effective in our work, but it's been disseminated um, even broader and picked up by the American Cancer Society. And when it comes down to clinical care, we've also been able to prove um, that it resulted in a reduction in healthcare costs, particularly later in life um, for individuals who have been diagnosed with cancer. So that work um, really started and spanned from focusing exclusively on outreach and awareness, so education, um, training individuals just to go out and give messages around cancer prevention and screening. And then we moved to interventions, including interventions focused on nutrition and physical activity, as well as interventions related to advocacy. So ensuring that um, our policies and practices and our lawmakers knew what was really important to make sure that we address our um, health disparities and ensure that there were screening programs available. And so what we did there was really highlight um, how we could train individuals in the community to advocate for what resources that they need in their community. And then lastly, on that trajectory of that, those 17 years of funding, we move people into biobehavioral research. Um, so up until that point, we had not done any type of randomized clinical trial, we built the infrastructure, we delivered community programs, and then the last five years, we really um, focus on a randomized trial in which I'll give you a little bit more detail about now. 
So the study design we had was um, pretty much, you know, what you might accept. So expect. So one was, you know, we had a group weight loss program, largely based on evidence-based programs that had shown to achieve, you know, a minimum of three to five percent weight loss. So this was the diabetes prevention program or weight loss maintenance programs, those of which you're very familiar with in terms of behavioral programs. Um, but in thinking about those community contexts that we talked about, we also recognize that even when you taught individuals what they needed to do to maintain, achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Um, there were things in the social context, the physical environment that may get in the way. Um, so we added an arm that included both the weight loss program plus these community strategies um, to address healthy eating and physical activity. And so this is this may not be the study design that you're most typically looking at. Um, and and you're right, it does there is no non treatment or, um, you know, um, control design here and that was purposeful. So when you're doing community based participatory research, one of the things that you really focus on is a partnership and early on when we started talking to our partners about the project when we were to coming up with the study design, the research questions and the like, what we heard loud and clear from each of the counties and communities we were working in was that no one wanted to be randomized to receive no kind of intervention whatsoever. This was at the peak of some of the data coming out that showed the, um, that up to 20% of cancers were connected to weight and obesity. And therefore our community partners said, we won't participate if we're not gonna get something. So this is ultimately the design that we ended up with. And so prior to delivering the intervention, we really wanted to um, really hone in on what Dr. Sh um, Shariki Kumiga talked about. So those cultural contexts, um, we wanted, we needed to know what the nutrition environment looked like for the communities that we were serving um, within the states of Alabama and Mississippi. And so we used a combination of our photo voice um, project, which is a, a really participatory method where you basically give tar your um, target audience um, cameras um, to go and take pictures in the thing in the community as it relates to a specific research question. Um, so for us, we ask people to take pictures of things in their community that either help them to eat a um, more healthy diet or got in the way of them being able to do that. We also paired that with a, um, an audit um, where we went out to food stores to see what was actually available in people's community. So if we were prescribing, you know, eating, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables and avoiding fast foods and fatty foods, we needed to know re basically relatively um, to other communities whether or not those things were, actually, were available. And so here you'll see that there was a combination of different things. We just selected a few pic uh, pictures here. Um, in certain communities, there were lots of um, either personal or community gardens, or um, they may also have farmers markets and, and foods, um, fruit and vegetable stands. But at the same time, there were a lot of places in which most of the meats looked like um, the pictures there on the right, where high, high in fat um, and were available and you know not having sort of lean or healthier meats available. And certain in this in these communities in our rural areas, um, we found that there were um, plenty of areas in which there was nothing but fast food as the restaurant um, opportunities. Like the nutrition environment, we also wanted to see what was happening in the physical activity environment. So here, the same thing, we had individuals uh, in the community to take pictures of things in their physical environment that either helped them to maintain um, a regular routine of, of physical activity or things that were getting in the way. And similarly, we did audits of um, street segments and other areas, um, resources for physical activity. And here again, we found that there was quite some variability. There were certain communities that had sidewalks, had buffers, had wonderful publicly accessible resources. And we had other areas where even if they had the resources available, um, poor infrastructure like you know, failure to have great drainage may, got, may have gotten in the way of individuals being able to utilize those resources. So taken together, we, we, um, we had the information about the um, 
the community. And then we went ahead to launch the three phase intervention program that was focused on the individuals in a group based setting. So again, the typical studies that you might be familiar with in terms of behavioral um, health. So weekly face to face group meetings, focusing on all those target behaviors that we know typically will get to five to 10% weight loss in the initial six months, and then some tapering over time um, in that second six months of, um, of, of treatment. The only thing that's a little bit different here, whereas this was a dissemination project, not an RCT, um, what we really focused on was if you did not achieve the five to 10% weight loss by the first six months, we really encouraged people to keep going. We didn't um, eliminate them from our trial if they didn't achieve that. Um, and then lastly, the second year, basically we transitioned from any kind of face-to-face -face group meeting um, to having only uh, phone-based sort of motivational calls that were exclusively led by our volunteers. Um, and again, here's sort of a snapshot of what the weekly sessions look like. So again, the typical behavioral kinds of things. So, you know, you know, introduction, talk about self-monitoring, including both physical activity and counting calories, um, you know, figuring out some SMART goals, um, some specific and measurable ones that we followed up on, and then giving people some, you know, strategies about how to eat healthy, how to purchase, purchase healthy foods, um, how to address some of the negative self-talk and manage your time, um, and then also plan for um, any kinds of issues around triggers or cravings or relapse um, prevention. Within that individual group structure, we, we focused on a uh, manualized treatment. So the people delivering the intervention were not our staff um, at the central office. These were part-time um, individuals with no not not having any necessary um, you know expertise in psychology or nutrition or physical activity, these were lay individuals that we trained um, to be able to live, deliver the intervention. So they had a manual, and then we also gave participants a manual to kind of follow along um, with the key things that they were going to do per session. We also, um, on the right there in the little box, we also made sure that each session focused on some kind of a cancer prevention message um, so that while we were focusing largely on weight and, and weight management and didn't you know, infuse a lot around cancer, we did want to continue. Someone had told them that they had a measurement that was not normal. Um, and so that was one of the challenges that we had in terms of our recruitment. But we did meet our recruitment goals. We had a, a a, a total of nine over our 400 goal there. And what the other things that we were very excited about is the significant um, um, you know, retention that we were able to have over the course of the project. So almost everybody stayed in, um, whether or not they were in the weight loss only or the weight loss po uh, plus program at six months and at 12 months and 18 months. And then we still had a substantial number of them that stayed with us through the end of the two years. So just a quick um, um, look at who the population was that we ended up um, recruiting. So in general, this was a, a population of um, African-American women who um, had incomes, um, household incomes of less than $30,000. So um, both across each of the groups and then um, as a summary. We also had a group that was, um, had particularly higher education um, here with the vast majority of them having either post high school or some type of college graduate um, degree, college um, graduated from college or some higher degree. And oftentimes people would ask me, how do those two things relate? Um, so how is it that individuals with a high school degree or higher um, are living and having household incomes 30,000 and below? And part of what I'll mention a little bit later, um, but that's, that's not difficult uh, for us to believe in the work that we've been doing over the past 20 years, that is quite typical. There are various hypotheses around this, including individuals being underemployed um, is one of the issues. Um, also in these rural communities, we also find that um, the job opportunities are not there. So many individuals may be on some type of assisted living because they are not fully employed. Um, and, um, and then others may be experiencing um, you know, lower pay, even if they are you know, at the, the um, the same rate of indiv other individuals within their community. 
We also just highlight a couple of things that we found in the study. So overall, the takeaway, we were able to achieve clinically significant weight loss um, in general, overall, from the participants in the study um, with significant changes in weight, BMI, and waist circumference. Um, when you look at, though, the difference between our two interventions, the group weight loss versus the weight loss plus the, um, the community interventions, we didn't find any substantial differences or significant differences between those groups. Um, but in general, our main outcome around weight at six months, we were able to achieve that um, with a population that was, um, again, more challenging typically in the literature and also one that was um, receiving an intervention that was not from um, professional individuals with training in nutrition, physical activity, or weight management. We also saw, um, saw in clinical improvements in blood pressure, um, as well as in cholesterol and triglycerides. And so we were very excited beyond sort of the typical weight um, that there were other improvements there. So thinking not only around, again, cancer prevention, but cardiovascular disease, you know, we also saw that we um, might be making some strides um, overall in that intervention. Um, but like many, uh, many studies, especially those that focus on uh, obesity and weight management, um, there were a number of challenges that we identified from our work. So first and foremost, we saw that there were the comorbid conditions. So what I mentioned before, um, that really limited participation of all the people that we screened through. So, you know, as we think about next steps, you know, we focused on, you know, talking about the need to increase research with populations that have multiple mor morbidity. We also thought about our implementation staff. So thinking about our staff, they, um, the positive thing is that they reflected the community that we were targeting, which is great, especially doing CBPR. But the downside is that, of that is they were still also very much struggling um, with diet, physical activity, and nutrition. And so we've talked about it in our future work, you know, have written in doing interventions first with our intervention staff before having them to advance to facilitation. And then one of the things that was quite surprising to us that, that um, we had a lot of participants that really were upset and disappointed when we started tapering out the weekly sessions. And we failed to recognize how this population of women really you know, appreciated the social connections of getting together. And when we started moving from phase one of weekly to then tapering them off for phase two and phase three, um, they were really disappointed with that. And so we've got to think about ways in which we can continue engagement beyond those type interventions. So we think the primary success, again, CBPR, um, we were able to get to a hard to reach population. Um, we showed that there was um, potential for improvements in health outcomes that were clinically meaningful. And we could train a lay health staff and volunteers to deliver an intervention, which again, is one of the first things we think about, you know, the cost of these type of trials. But I also think that at the end of the day, we, we also took a step back and we thought about some of those things that are really challenging and what were some of the other um, outcomes that may be attributable to social factors. So this is a paper where, um, again, when we focus on a lot of different things in lung cancer, you know, if you think about the deaths that were attributable to lung cancer um, in this particular year, you know, close to 15, 155,000, you'll notice that low education, racial segregation, and low social support are also, you know, believed to contribute to even more of those deaths when investigators really teased out what was the other social determinants of health. So things like that really have stuck with, with me personally and some of the work that we've done. And so I, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, what that impact is. And this is a, an interesting paper that came out of science, actually, that show that there's a generational impact of social determinants of health. Um, we really encourage you to go back and, and, and dive into this one. Um, but both across humans and other um, animals, what you find is um, social integration, social status, um, and early life adver adversity were really predictive um, here of your, with your social determinants. So whether or not that's income, social network, um, um, and so forth, there was a real connection and link between social determinants and overall mortality here. 
And so why is that relevant um, and what are the costs there? So there are certainly historical matters that, that play into those um, generational impacts of social determinants. And some of the pic pictures here you might figure out, so redlining and um, the Voters' Right Act, Act, and then you know some of the uh, environmental toxins and certainly civil rights um, and the um, Board of Education, um, Brown versus Board of Education. And so those historical matters play a role, I think, in some of the health outcomes we see, particularly our racial and ethnic di um, disparities. We also know that there's a history um, and have historical matters of Blacks in science and medicine. So as we're thinking about some of the challenges that we have today, you know, our original origins, so I, I say that, um, because I'm in a school of medicine, our original origins are not ones in which um, we've been very thoughtful um, or very humane um, for other individuals as well who identify as being Black or African American. Likewise, um, some of you may be familiar with a couple of these stories as it relates to um, clinical trials and biomedical research. Um, Mr. Hardiman, who was one of several school children that were um, received um, um, toxic doses of radiation through experimentation, um, and, it, and a story that actually wasn't told until more recently um, when he sat down and did a documentary um, with someone who was a community member. But so for seven or 80 years, he lived with literally a hole in his head from radiation that happened as a result of people trying out um, new um, equipment on, on young Black children. Um, the story of Henrietta Lacks, especially if you're in the cancer space, um, you'll know that story and how, um, you know, cells um, were taken from her, unbeknownst to her and her family members and were utilized and still are actively utilized today, have led to lots of discoveries around cancer um, control. But again, the, the, the issue of um, informed consent and some of the challenges that exist. And, and likely many of you are familiar with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that went on for 40 years here in my home home state um, in which individuals who had syphilis were denied um, life-saving treatment. But not, let's not only think about the things in history. There are some contemporary matters as well. Um, so many of these are similar pictures as the one we saw from history, um, with obviously the exception of COVID-19. So the impact of COVID-19 on cancer prevention and control in particular is one that, that we are currently grappling with. Um, and it has not been um, as universal in terms of its impacts as, as some of the other conditions that we know of. So for example, many of the, the areas in the middle on that map that are red are some of the same um, communities that we did our interventions in related to nutrition and physical activity. Areas that are largely African-American and, and largely areas that, that lack the infrastructure to really support. Um, that, that region is called the Black Belt region um, of the state and it kind of goes through um, across the um, southern region of our, of our state. Uh, we also know that in rural areas, um, many of whom did not expand um, to get more Medicaid coverage are also those areas where our hospitals are closing. And as you think of this confluence of issues of COVID, of, um, of, um, of cancer and of rural healthcare closings, um, again, you know, we, we look at some of the disparities and how this might be contributing to that. Um, we also know, and today, um, that there are other issues that are plaguing our work and our ability to address health outcomes. So as we are thankfully very close to being able to pivot to have vaccines for COVID-19, we're still dealing with issues of trust, the same ones that um, have permeated some of the, the thoughts about many communities of color. Um, and we know that some of the same things, crowded housing, um, other things that are social determinants may impact our ability to push out um, vaccinations and other treatments for COVID. And then we also know that there's implicit bias that, that comes into play. Um, so this is just a paper think, um, looking at implicit racial bias of oncologists um, and found that these oncologists who had that implicit racial bias were likely to have shorter patient interactions. They gave less supportive care. Um, they, they're, um, more patients had difficulty remembering the content of that interaction. And so the basic you know, takeaway is that they were likely, those patients are likely getting um, a less quality of care as a result of biases that may exist um, from their provider. 
Beyond that, we also know that there is a general distrust in medical care providers. Um, this is just looking at a recent survey, a poll, um, where you can see the differential rates by Black, Hispanic, and whites to the simple question of do you think your doctors um, do you think doctors not providing the same level of care to black people is a reason why they have worse health out outcomes on average than whites? And then similarly, the same um, poll looked at the overall healthcare system. So generally speaking, how often do you think our healthcare system treats people unfairly based on their race or ethnic background? So again, you'll see the differences in perceptions by individuals who identify as black, Hispanic, or white. So all of these things um, lead to our costs. Um, so from a direct cost um, situation, we, we know that over $230 billion in direct medical care expenditures are associated with illnesses and premature death um, between these years that this study you know, really looked at. We also know that chronic disease in general um, you know, leads to about a trillion dollars each year. And in my state, um, close to $19 billion of that in lost productivity. So your indirect costs. So people who are not showing up for work or when they do show up, they're not able to give their, their all. Other costs uh, for those of us who are in the healthcare system, we know that there are costs as it relates to readmissions. Um, and we know that the social determinants are oftentimes the reason for those readmissions. So individuals are not being compliant largely because they're being defiant. Um, they may not be able to do it because they, they have these other barriers that limit their ability to follow the instructions and directions that we give them upon discharge. And this was highlighted in a um, article from the circulation when they kind of looked at um, not only the individual factors, but they wanted to explain where the neighborhood, that's, that's neighborhood context might play a role in terms of, um, of readmissions as it relates to heart failure. And so what they found was that neighborhood socioeconomic status was associated with six month all cause readmission for patients with heart um, failure. So it wasn't at the individual level that they were showing a major component of this. It's really at the neighborhood level and some of the things that we mentioned that I mentioned before. So not having a pharmacy, not having um, a, a great place to have um, healthy foods and so forth were really predictive of who was going to show back up. Um, there are also, you know, gaps in terms of economics. So this is some uh, a recent report from the Citigroup talking about um, the cost of some of these gaps. So racial wage gap, for example, an additional 6.8 trillion in income would be there if we didn't see those differences. Or housing credit access, an additional 770,000 Black homeowners over 20 years would be there if we did not have these gaps that exist. And again, thinking about you know, your, your housing and how that plays into your healthcare access, your education access and so forth. Um, these are some of the other costs of the inequities that we see. And then when we think about how do we close the gaps again, this is, this is just dollars and cents. So it's not about you know, um, altruism, which is great, um, but if we only think about the economic costs that we, we are having, it's really important for us to know that there are lots of places where we could be saving dollars and more than saving dollars, we could actually be adding um, each year to the GDP. So I, I usually think about you know, the system itself is working the way it was intended. So, so you know, the discrimination and disparities that we exist were sort of baked into the system. So I, I often leave with this idea of what do we need to do to break the system that currently exists. And there are several things. So I think part of it is we've got to start reducing the risk from these social determinants. So many um, public health schools and, and schools of medicine have focused on you know, doing various trainings around bias, um, provider training and bias assessments, um, also making sure that we're assessing the needs of our patients, and then not only just collect the information, but connect them with community resources to address those needs. Um, we also have to show that we're improving the social support there and we have to collaborate and advocate for policies and practices that we know are going to improve individuals health. 
another way that I think that we can, you know, save off costs is that we've got to actually diversify our workforce. So this is data uh, from the AAMC looking at applicants, matriculants, and those who enroll and graduate um, in U.S. medical schools by race. And this was the year, the most recent data from 2019 to 2020. And what you should be able to see here is, is there's clearly uh, um, a racial, a significant racial disparity that exists in terms of who is actually moving on um, to medical schools. And these are numbers that have not moved dramatically over the last couple of decades. Um, and this is looking at uh, medical school faculty. Um, so again, you know, not a whole lot of difference in terms of the, the, the ranks there, but thinking about our leaders, so our full professors, our associate professors, um, again, we see that there's a significant difference there in terms of who's actually going into these programs and achieving these levels, particularly given that African Americans make up somewhere between 12 to 13% of the US population. And it's not just in the medical schools, um, it's also in our healthcare leadership as well. So here is some data that just looks at um, the minority representation among house, hospital leadership. And so the takeaway take here is that across the, the four or five years that they looked at it, um, not much change at all in terms of the minority representation. And then I think the other piece um, on a series of articles that have been published in the last few months from the New England um, in the New England Journal of Medicine have really honed in on this idea that equity, diversity, and inclusion are really essential to achieve excellence in education, clinical care, and research. And so there are lots of ideas about how we move this forward, including an anti-racism curriculum, um, focusing on things that are not just at the surface and moving beyond a moment. Um, so a couple of things I'll, I'll end with, um, I want to make sure that, that we know the difference here between equality and equity. So when we're talking about disparities, we really are talking about making sure that individuals get what they need to succeed. And some of you may have seen this cartoon or something similar to it in the past, um, where basically, you know, one of the prevailing thoughts is we just give everybody the same thing and everybody will be fine. Well, depending on your outcome, and in this, in this cartoon, the outcome is being able to see the sporting event. So if everybody has the same thing, you're not getting achieving that goal um, versus the, 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 um, the section on the right, which talks about equity, is where everyone is getting what they need in order to, to be successful in whatever that outcome is. And so one of the shifts, I think, one of the other shifts um, to reduce our costs is to move to a model that is much more about equity and giving people what they need to succeed. And then lastly, you know, I think the idea is what will it take to get a measurable um, change and sustain it as it relates to population health? Um, and the hint there um, really obvious is it's not more buckets. Um, we have to start addressing those social determinants of health. Um, we've got to start dealing with not only our direct costs, but we have to deal with our human costs in a social level um, and try to address those things going forward. So with that, um, I will stop and I know we have a panel and maybe have a little time for some questions. Bravo. <laughs> Thanks, Monica, um, for that excellent talk. Uh, we do have a number of questions in the chat box and I'm gonna invite others to add them uh, if you have further questions. But just starting off, um, we have some questions about uh, you know, the work that you've done with CBPR and clearly you've been You've been very successful with that, but um, but I know you know firsthand that there are there are many challenges. Um, so we have some questions about that, uh, asking about, for example, how you recruit um, for your intervention teams, what sorts of things you look for in those community staff members who actually um, do the interventions. And I'm going to ask you one more question along those okay. lines, and that is, um, uh, how do you develop? Um, how, do you, how does the academic community develop trust on the part of the community members, given the many, um, uh, many, many uh, things that you talked about where, um, where Blacks are taken advantage of in the context of research? Sure. Yeah, so excellent questions. We probably could be here for another three hours talking about any one of those. But, you know, identifying that staff is really, really critical. So I, I will admit that I cheated a bit. Um, so when I started doing my work a couple of, um, you know, 
15 plus years ago, I walked into an existing academic community partnership that was up and running. Um, in those first five years of the NCI funding, what, what happened was building those relationships and it takes time. Um, so, you know, when I talk to junior faculty and particularly say, oh, I'm interested in CBPR. And I'm like, the only way I'm gonna endorse you doing that is if you do like I did and connect with someone who's already in the community. Because it takes time, you have to not only um, do you need the, the to build on what people other people have done you have to have credibility so as an african american female with family members that you know were born and raised in the deep south i still had to establish myself as someone who was trustworthy um, and that i would deliver on what i said i was going to do and so that's really critical and so our staff you know, really the, the first and foremost, they had to be familiar with the, the population that we're reaching. So we, we recruit them, they live there, we do their training. So they are UAB employees, despite the fact that they live in Mississippi or they live in South Alabama. Um, we want people who are genuinely connected um, to their community. So we kind of were doing social networking before it got famous. Um, so we would ask around, you know, who who do you know in your community that is the person that everybody goes to? And so we started coming up with lists and names of those individuals. And we went out and we targeted, we interviewed them um, because we needed to have people who were also credible in the community there. So I think, you know, first and foremost, people who have passion for their community um, had a strong um, community network and, and were really to just roll up their sleeves and learn were some of the characteristics that um, we looked for. Um, with respect to the other question, again, about, you know, just general credibility, you've got to actually spend a lot of time, and that's why it takes so long, you spend a lot of time providing service. So before you go in and start asking of people, you need to provide something um, of value to them. So, um, you know, that's really critical. And, and it is very difficult with the, the long-term trust. I mean, there are spaces now, I work on different projects, and so, you know, I'm pretty well known around the cancer space, but I'm also, you know, moving into some of the COVID-19 and vaccination space where I'm taking a couple of steps back and I have to be willing to take the tough questions and stand there and answer those, which is sometimes very difficult for people to do. So it's it's not easy. I, I do think it's very personally rewarding, um, but, but I think academic um, institutions that are willing to do this have to put some upfront um, costs in there, some sweat equity and provide services and resources, including financial resources um, before trying to come in and recruit participants. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. And you also, I think, got to one of the other questions that was asked about um, how, what do you tell what do you tell uh, new faculty who want to get involved with CBPR yeah. given the challenges? But I think you, you covered um, some of that. I wanted to ask you a more specific yeah. question about CBPR um, from Kim Gans, who I, who I you know, and, and yeah. does engage research. Um, and she's asking, how do you navigate this challenge when you go into a community and they're asking for interventions in, or, you know, in areas that either there isn't funding for or maybe not feasible? And how do you sort of navigate and juggle that issue of, yes, I'm here to address the issues that, you, that are an issue for you, but at the same time, we have to be feasible within the context we have. You know, what do you do about that situation? Yeah, so I, I appreciate the um, the question. And, 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 and yes, I know Kim is doing this work. So I think you, first and foremost, you're gonna have to meet the community where they are. So you're gonna have to find ways to um, to be able to address the community's needs. And the way that we do that are, you know, my team, we, we do that through partnerships. So not everything can we literally do, um, you know, and, and we're not funded to do that. And we may have strict guidelines on what we can and cannot do. So, so for example, the piece that I mentioned early on about our advocacy, well, we have federal dollars, we cannot do advocacy. Um, but what we did was we partnered with American Cancer Society who has a, a advocacy arm. And so we could educate you know, individuals, we could create some supplies and materials, we could leverage our extensive network to the ACS to do that work. Um, and so I think partnerships is one of the ways in which you can get those communities needs met. But, but, but in, you know, in my opinion, you absolutely have to make every effort to try to address the needs that they have. And that's part of establishing your credibility. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate um, um, that response. And you talked a bit about advocacy. And, and so with that, I sort of want to transition to these questions about that and about, you know, sort of the translation from research findings to policy change. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which I know is a big issue within SBM as well. Yes. Um, and so, you know, there's a question here, you know, sort of more, speci more specifically about how do you get states, local communities, private organizations to be more engaged in efforts to reduce disparities? And I think just more generally, um, you know, what, what's your advice or sort of your inspiration for translation of research findings into, into policy change? Yeah, I, I think I think it very much still is around finding the right people and connecting the right people and coming up with um, you know your your shared goals. So we we come at it. Organizations have different missions, but if we can agree on a, a shared goal like health equity, for example, um, and highlight that you know focusing on health equity is has benefit for all of us. So not only those individuals who are negatively impacted, um, but from like looking at the costs, um, it impacts all of us. So if we can come to some agreement about a shared value and then partner with different groups, I think that's very helpful. Um, the other thing is, again, for our residents, we wanna put tools in their hands that they can use to leverage um, and, and focus on their the local context, which really is important. And so we provide training, we provide that leverage to do so. Um, but, but the main thing is, finding that coalition and building that coalition and maintaining that coalition to put continued pressure on those individuals to do the right thing. Um, that, that's what I think we've gotten, you know, some small wins here and there, um, but it's, it's only through those partnerships. I don't think any one group or organization can do it alone. Yeah, excellent. I see maybe time for one more question here. Um, and, and has this question in, has your program linked with um, community, existing community groups such as churches, barbershops, or, or other sorts of organizations like that? Absolutely, all of the above. So I think, you know, when we started out the network, we, we focused on both the local um, network, so churches, hospitals, uh, providers, offices, um, and then we also focus on statewide, so our state com um, ca um, cancer coalition, we focus with that group, and then at the national level as well. So again, you know, we, we take partners all around, so if we have a shared interest around reducing health disparities, then we're going to find a way to work together. Again, just want to thank you, Dr. Baskin, for coming and the excellent talk. Um, really an honor, a privilege to have you here. I want to uh, second uh, David's comments. Uh, thank you so, so very much for a really terrific presentation, very inspiring. And uh, we, we, we've learned a lot and appreciate it. My Thanks. pleasure. It, it's, uh, it's great to meet you. Yes. <laughs>